Hello everyone, I'm Sam. And I'm Caitlin. And this is Team Get Over It. We're an all-female team participating in the greatest motoring adventure on the planet. The Mongol Rally. We'll be driving 10,000 miles across mountains, deserts, and unknown terrain. And along the way, we hope to spread our feminist and environmental ideals. Join us here as we share our stories, thoughts, and interviews as we get ready for the Mongol Rally 2021. Welcome back, everybody. Hi. So glad to have you here with us again. Um, Today, we're talking about something that's probably on the forefront of most people's minds. Mm -hmm. What is the Mongol Rally? Absolutely. Every time I mention that, they ask me, what is Get Over It? What is it for? And then I say, oh, it's for the Mongol Rally. As if, like, I always answer that question as if people should know what it is. Because I think people should know what it is. But in actuality, very few people do. So we are taking this opportunity to explain what the Mongol Rally is. Yeah, exactly. So Mm. essentially, the Mongol Rally is this intercontinental car rally that begins Mm -hmm. in Europe and ends in Russia. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite descriptions I've seen of it on the Adventurous website is motoring stupidity on a global scale. (sighs) Poetry. (laughs) It is. Yeah, Um. so... Um, The Mongol Rally, essentially, me and Caitlin will be spending 10,000 miles in a one liter car driving Mm -hmm. all the way from somewhere in England, ending in Russia, going through, I think, 16 countries. Yeah, well, yeah, probably at least 16. Yeah. And then it kind of it's going to depend, too, on what's going to be open next year. Official start point of the rally is in Prague. Hmm. in Czech Republic. However, there are a lot of really epic launch parties that take place almost all over Europe, depending on like whoever wants to host them. Hence why we will probably start in England. Plus we, I mean, we have friends in England anyway that we were going to visit. So for us, we're going to start in England and then possibly just kind of motor around from there. Yeah. And that's actually a really good segue sort of into the history of the Mongol rally because it Hmm. is named Mongol rally. And Mm. so anyone that may have heard of it in the past might have heard of it starting in London, going all the way to Mongolia, which has obviously changed for numerous reasons. Primarily, I think just the cost of the launch party. It's a lot cheaper to do that in Prague than it was to do it near or outside London. Yeah, that's really true. And then even the ending point, because it's supposed to end, it's called the Mongol Rally. So originally it did end in Mongolia. However, it changed. (laughs) Because of, I don't know exactly, but because of, I think, like, car laws, like, whenever you can, like, sell your cars or ditch your cars. So now it ends in Ulan Ud, Russia. But we still do need to pass through Mongolia. And I think a lot of teams, like, what they do is they kind of go to the finish line, have a party, and then maybe come back into Mongolia to spend some time. I know, I think that's our plan. uh, And I'm really excited to do that. Yeah, exactly. So Mm. that's sort of the premise of the Mongol Rally, but it actually has a lot more to it than just Mm. sort of adventuring around in a small shitty car for a month, two months. Oh, Um, can you can you tell us more about how shitty how shitty are these cars? (laughs) Yeah, how shitty is this car going to be? Our parents want to know. Um, (laughs) So there are three main rules to the Mongol Rally. Um, The first one is called small and shit. And so essentially you're going to be in a farcically small vehicle of one liter or less. And the more likely it is to break down along the way, the better. And they say you shouldn't be spending more than 200, 300 pounds on the car. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting. So I was actually looking that up. Um, There's a lot of debate, I guess, about whether like what the best cars are. And it totally depends on what kind of experience you want to have while on your rally. So I I was looking at some uh, advice that previous ralliers were giving to like noobs like us. And one guy said, yeah, micros. So this is like Nissan micros are talking about the kind of car have an annoying habit of finishing the rally in one piece. Get a Fiat or a Peugeot or something that definitely won't. So a lot of people do have this kind of, what's the word, opinion that the worse the car, the better. 
And it's, a, yeah, exactly. it's amazing. Yeah. To, Cause it totally changes your experience during the rally. Yeah. And so that's sort of our goal. Mm. We'll be buying a car probably in England, I think is our plan. Mm, yeah. Um, just because it's easier for non-European citizens to buy cars in England than it is any other country in terms of registration. Mm. Um, but we'll be looking for the shittiest car. So if we have any listeners out there in England and you're like, oh, I have this great car, doesn't even start, <laughs> give us a call. <laughs> Please. We're interested. Uh-huh. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's automatic or manual. Um, cause either way, we're going to probably toast it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. In fact, I think, do you know how to drive a manual, a stick shift? Nope. <laughs> okay. Same. So, which I think most of the cars and especially the countries you're going to be driving through, it's recommended to have a manual or a stick shift mm. because when you break down in certain countries, they're not going to have the parts to fix an automatic car. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely going to be an adventure. Two girls who don't know how to drive a stick shift <laughs> go buy a really shitty one and then try to drive 10,000 miles with it. Oh, man. I tried. I, I did. I did at one point. I had a friend who had a manual car and I was trying to get him to teach me. But like I kind of gave up after 20 minutes because it was frustrating. <laughs> and, and I, it was kind of it's a little bit embarrassing, too, because it was, you know, my friend and I didn't want him to. Anyway, so I did. I did make an attempt at one point, but it just it didn't pan out at all in that case but but cars yeah so some of the cars that like I've been looking at that too um like researching what the what the best and like I'm using air quotes here like quote unquote best car would be to use for the Mongol rally and there's a lot of like I said there's a lot of debate and almost controversy around it because like you were saying too it has to be really small a one liter engine you can I mean if if you're really stuck I, I have seen a lot of people using a 1.2 liter engine but of course we're going to try to stick like as close to the rules as possible because there, there aren't many um, there's there's only a few and so I think we're gun- we're gunning for the one liter engine ourselves and some of the cars that have come really recommended are like I was mentioning Nissan Micras Suzuki Swifts and even like Ford Fiestas apparently are pretty common cars but you kind of get like bonus points or at least like more admiration and respect from fellow ralliers if you do it the rally in like a weird vehicle so i saw some pictures of like people doing it in like dune buggies there was a guy in 2019 i think who did it in a smart car um anything like fiat's or like ladas and then like volkswagen rabbits people have done it in different kinds and then I even heard mention of maybe someone doing it in a Rolls Royce, like an old Rolls Royce, <laughs> which is insane. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, if we can get our hands on one of those for under 200, let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the first rule is that we're going to be mm. in a small shit car for 10,000 miles. The other two rules... The second one, you're on your own. So essentially, there's no set route and there's no backup. So if we break down, if we get arrested, if we get injured, there's no team swooping in to mm-hmm. save us. We're really yeah. on and our I've own. I've heard some stories too about, especially the arresting part, because I have heard stories of um, some teams being detained or arrested at borders, especially with Russia, for having illegal substances. Because, you know, I mean, we, Sam and I are both worldly travelers uh so we kind of understand that you know different countries have different rules about like which drugs are legal or not so even if you have a prescription for it you still might have trouble at a border to a different country because in that country that drug is illegal so you have to be really careful about that kind of stuff and i think like some teams have had trouble with that in the past um like other teams have like just been become stuck because their car broke down and they just had to like with through their own grit and determination either like you know continue on buy a new car i've heard stories of people who had to like change their cars completely in the middle of the rally uh buy a new car to continue on or on the other hand you could also just like kind of gently abandon your car (laughs) or sell it somewhere and then just uh you know go back home so it's it's totally up to you what's going to happen. Yeah. Which is part of what makes it so fun. But yeah. So in all of this adventure, there is actually sort of a 
deeper purpose, I guess you could say, which is where the third rule comes in, and that's the fact that you have to raise money for charity. So the manga rally stipulates that you have to raise 500 pounds for the charity that they directly partner with, which is Cool Earth. And we'll be doing another podcast about that soon, sort of talking about what Cool Earth does. Um, and But then after the 500 pounds, any additional money you raise can go to any charity of your choice. And so we have chosen, if our name, our team name didn't give it away, we have mm-hmm. chosen the Center for Reproductive yeah, Rights. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really important to us um, to donate to both charities because, like we were saying before, like uh, through our website and things, we are... I guess adventurous and travelers and Mm -hmm. outdoors women. So we do a lot of biking and hiking, camping, you know, we have a great respect for nature. So of course, like we're more than thrilled to support cool earth and we're also feminists. And as women who exist in this world, reproductive rights are something that are like really important to us. So we're really happy that we're able to like support and donate to these two charities. Um, And especially like center for reproductive rights, I feel like they're active in 50, at least 50 different countries, and they're always uh, fighting for reproductive health care access and even just in general, like women's health access because in a lot of places, even in even in like countries like the United States and in Canada or uh, other countries where you think it like, you know, the health care is pretty good. There's still a lot of like legislation and stuff that are preventing women from accessing healthcare that they desperately need. So I'm really, I guess, thankful to that charity for existing and all the work that they do and really happy that I can support them in some way. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And like we said, we will be discussing those charities in more detail in later podcasts. So stay tuned for that. We'll go into what each charity does specifically, where they work, how Mm -hmm. you can help, how you can contribute and what your funds will go towards if you donate to us. So, should we get into the history of the Mongol rally? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, I think it's a good idea to also explain because it's just, it's so odd. It, it, it's kind of something that you wouldn't really think exists in this day and age, but I think it's also perfect that it exists in this day and age. Because when you think about adventuring and exploring, you know, that's something that people did in the 1800s or, you know, Christopher Columbus, uh, not something that people do now because it's like what part of the world hasn't been <clears throat> explored yet or visited and like which 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 city and which town doesn't have a starbucks yet so it doesn't really seem like there's really much room for it anymore and then of course with our busy lives like how can you just take a, like a couple months off and be able to do one of these adventures but many years ago the early well literally the early 2000s in 2001 this absolute idiot genius you can take your pick on what to call him named Tom kind of came up with this idea to start at first, first it was the Mongol rally. So he's a Brit, he's from the UK. um, And he had this idea to drive his car to Asia. And so he and his friend kind of like embarked in 2001 on the first ever Mongol rally. It failed. (laughs) They were not able to make it, but they kind of had like an open, like an open invite for anybody. I think it was like 2004. And then at that time, six teams showed up, somebody made it. And then after that, like word of mouth spread. And then by 2006, it became quite popular, right? 2006, 2007. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So in 2004, they had six teams. Mm -hmm. In 2005, 43 teams. Mm -hmm. 2006, they had 167 teams. Mm. And by the registration for the 2007 Mongol rally, they had to limit it to 200 teams. And their servers actually crashed within 22 seconds. Yeah, that's amazing. Of opening registration just from sheer popularity of people wanting to do this rally. Yeah, it's pretty, and I mean, you wouldn't think, but 200 teams, if people have like at least like two or three people per team, that's like maybe around 700 people at least participating in the rally. That's a lot of people for something like this. Yeah, and so if you think about that too, so they've averaged roughly after 2007, they've averaged around 250 to 300 teams each year. And if you think about each of those teams raising at minimum 500 pounds, but often you see teams going well and way beyond raising thousands of dollars for Cool Earth mm. and other charities as well. Mm. Um, so if you think about all those teams year after year, that's an enormous amount of money that this rally has raised for charity. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And I, 
Oh, well, we're going to talk about it later, I was going to say, but I think, and especially this past year um, with the fires, all the forest fires that have been happening around the world, I think it, like now more than ever, it's it's very important to raise awareness for rainforest health, uh, rainforest rights, and then also just like environmental rights in general. So, you know, I'm really happy and thankful for this <laughs> this kind of adventure for existing and for, you know, being so kind of environmentally minded. It's really nice. Should I yeah. talk, should I talk about some of the other because it's not just it's not just the Mongol rally that they have, but they have like actually if if I guess car rallies are not your thing or if you can't make it to Asia, um, they also offer so the the organization like it's called the Adventurists and you know they're most famous for their Mongol rally, but they have a number of other races and other kinds of adventures that they do offer. So I honestly think that there's a little something for everyone. Um, some adventures you know fare better than others. Some of them only lasted like one or two runs or three runs um, before being canceled indefinitely <laughs> or put on hold for a while. But then other ones are actually still pretty popular. So just, just to give an example, um, so they have something called like the Gaucho Derby, which is a 10-day Patagonian horse race. That one's new. The first Gaucho Derby was actually this year in 2020. Um, I believe they were able to run it. So they, they ran it earlier this year. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. They also have another derby. They have the Mongol Derby. So again, going back to Mongolia. Um, and the Mongol Derby actually is the Guinness World Record holder for the longest horse race. So technically, it's like an ultra endurance horse race. And it's thousands of kilometers on horseback. And it's really interesting because they change, they change horses every 40 kilometers. So it actually takes them about like 1,500 horses, but for only 40 riders. So they cap the max Shit. riders. Yeah, isn't that insane? So they cap it at 40 riders, um, but it, so, it sells out every year. And that's been going on since, I don't actually, oh, I didn't write down the date, but it, that's been going on for quite a few years already as well. And it's, it's very popular. They also tried to do <laughs> other things like kind of in the same vein of the Mongol rally, but they did have the African rally, which they launched in 2008, but they, it only ran three times. Just to kind of give you guys a taste of like what may happen during a, a rally, um, the, the guys were accused of terrorism and they were, they like almost, I guess, like got murdered. So they kind of put that one on hold for a little while. Um, they also have something called the rickshaw run, which is established in 2006, which happens around Southeast Asia. So they get this little tiny rickshaw also very like low powered. So you can go from Sri Lanka to Southeast Asia. And then also, I think they have like an Indian rickshaw run these days as well. And they have, this is, this is so funny. I, the Icarus Trophy is something that I want to try. The Icarus Trophy, they started in 2015 and it's a paramotoring race. Have you ever heard of that before? Paramotoring? No, you're going to have to explain this. It's like, I watched the, they have like a YouTube video trying to, what's the word I'm looking for? Promote it. It looks insane. So basically you be, you just have a, um, why can't I remember any words this morning? A parasail? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you see, like a parasail and a motor, like strapped onto your body with a huge fan, and basically you just kind of like take off the ground and just fly. How far do you go? It, it can be quite far and quite high, actually. So, so it, it was started in the U.S. So the first the first test run was in the U.S., but they also have it in um, South Africa and Zimbabwe before. And the main draw to this event is that it's extremely unregulated, <laughs> which I thought, Excellent. I know, I thought that was insane. So if you ever want to try like, you know, a one man kind of uh, aircraft sort of thing, then do that. Um, another thing that's also really popular is the monkey run. So in, oh, I've heard of this one. Yeah. So you get on this like a little like 125 cc bike. It's basically like a mini bike. And the first, the first run that they did was from Morocco down to like Cameroon or somewhere. Um, and like, so basically they were just like biking through deserts. It looks absolutely amazing, but they also have it through Mar or Romania, sorry, Romania, Peru, and also Mongolia. So they offer that in a couple of different countries and the list goes on. Yeah. They just have so many things, so many things. So if, you know, driving a car throughout, you know, Asia, Eurasia and Europe is not your thing, then take a look at their website. And you can pick through like any kinds of adventures, whatever suits your fancies, they have an adventure for you. Yeah. And chances are, if you don't see something you want to do, but you have an idea, you could probably contact them. And if it's crazy enough, I think they would help start that. 
you can, and you can even volunteer because they're always trying to dream up new ideas. Uh, and I think they, they do, when they have a new idea, they look for volunteers to see how feasible it is. So even if you have some spare time on your hands, you're just looking for some kind of really strange, awesome and unregulated fun, <laughs> then yeah, take a look and then see if you can sign up and volunteer for something. Like you could be a pioneer. Can you imagine that like on your resume or CV and just be like, you know, 2021, like I tried, <laughs> I tried like the Icarus run, I don't know, Japan or something. That would be insane. That would be so amazing. It would definitely be a conversation starter. Definitely. And like, that's kind of what it is. Like that's, I think that's sort of what is needed these days. I, I know like a lot of people kind of think it sounds insane, but it's just <sighs> these sorts of adventures and just experience in the world and through a different lens. I think is just so rewarding and so important and just being able to challenge yourself too and like have all these adventures. Like I'm just, I'm just trying to think about like what our future is going to be like on the road, going through border control or border patrols, um, maybe bribing police officers, you know, speaking shitty Russian at people. <laughs> mm, yeah, that's right. Uh, disclaimer for all our listeners, Caitlin is going to be our Russian speaker in the team. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah but <laughs> uh, I need to get on on that because I was I was being really diligent and I was making pretty good progress studying Russian Russian honestly is like not that difficult to learn I think my or my grammar is not going to be perfect but as long as like like ugh, what did I get I said Nasha Machini Ploho which means our car bad <laughs> that's honestly all the Russian we need that's it <laughs> that's it Sivonia Srida. Today is Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> also important. Also important. Yeah. Our car is bad. Today mm. is Wednesday. Today is Wednesday. And then like, uh, what is it? Ani vodka spasiba. Which means one vodka, please. <laughs> See, I think you're ready. Yeah, right, I think yeah. you've got this. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I mean, like there's more that I know a little bit more than that, but I need to, I need to get on that. Um, which I think is going to be super helpful because that's another thing too about the Mongol rally is like the reason why, like the reason for these rules, you're on your own, you have to buy a shitty car is because they want you to break down. Like that's a part of adventuring is like breaking down, ah, like getting stuck somewhere and then having to talk to locals, you know, and like you just having your adventure and then like getting to know people from different countries and having different experiences getting invited into people's homes. Ugh, I can't wait. It's going to be so much fun. Yeah, exactly. I think that's, at least for us, the biggest appeal of the Mongol rally mm. is really just, you know, you're not driving through in a luxury vehicle, just getting from point A to point B. You know, the fact of having a shitty small car is that it's going to break down and you're going to have to, you know, talk to people. You're going to have to maybe walk miles to find someone to change a spare tire yeah so well that's something else that we have to learn too is how to i mean i can i've what did i I've, I've changed radiator fluids before and i in theory know how to change a tire but other than that i don't really know anything about mechanics <laughs> well i i know how to check the oil yeah and i could reasonably fix most things with duct tape oh yeah we're definitely going to need to like duct tape a lot of things we should just, in the trunk of our car, put boxes and boxes. Of <laughs> but it, no, duct tape is surprisingly useful. When I went tree planting, uh, like people would duct tape their tent poles, like if their tent poles snapped or even like one guy, either, either it was a bear or it could have been a dog. We're not really sure. Possibly bear. Ripped apart his tent and he just like duct taped it back together. <laughs> so <laughs> Honestly, yeah. duct tape fixes everything it does it does so yes we're gonna need duct tape flex tape every kind of tape and then that's good <laughs> <be. laughs> if there are any tape companies listening we need some sponsors hey yeah hey sponsor <laughs> us in tape <laughs> that's gonna be oh my goodness but i think that's something else that we should probably prepare for too probably or not i mean that's the thing it's like even how much preparation you do beforehand or like not it doesn't even matter so speaking i mean speaking of preparation so i was um trying to i guess like learn a little bit more about the teams and people who participate uh in the mongol rally and i heard i heard a story last year about like two korean guys that kind of joined at the last minute 
And <laughs> speaking of not being prepared, um, they didn't even have a car. <laughs> so they just, I guess what they did is they just took like buses and trains and stuff instead, which is whatever. It doesn't matter. There's no, like there, there are only three rules. Technically they're not really breaking anything. So I thought that was amazing. I mean, amazing. technically if you don't have a car, then your leader is under the one liter max. Right. Exactly. Cause you're just working on like your, you know, your body, your own body. But, and that's amazing. I thought that was such an inspiring story <laughs> doing a motor race without even having a car. That's fantastic. It's fantastic. Yeah. Any amount of preparation that you do in like some kind of endeavor like this is just going to, as, as soon as like trouble hits and it will hit, then all of your preparation is going to be out the window. Mm. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Like there's only so much preparation you can reasonably do. And I think you talk to any team that's done it in the past and that's their one piece of advice consistently mm. across the board is just mm -hmm. don't try to prepare because you can't expect the unexpected. And it's, and even like next year too, because uh, Sam and I were talking about this just before we started this podcast, like next year too, we're wondering how many borders are going to be open after COVID and whether or not we're going to have to change. Cause we, we have a, our route planned tentatively, but I mean, we've already had to kind of change it mm. before um, like originally we were planning on going through Iran, but then earlier this year, some people may have forgotten with everything that's been going on. Um, but you know, world war three almost broke out. So we figured it wasn't very safe to go through Iran. So we might go th over the Caspian sea instead. Uh, and then, but with COVID-19 too, and borders maybe not, or maybe being open, then we might have to change it further and that's fine. So I think like, you know, you need to be, especially for something like this, you need to be very flexible. You need to be open. You need to have money prepared for bribes <laughs> to get over borders, but it's just going to be so much fun. It will be understandably, but it will be what it will be. Yeah. I think the more trouble we get into, potentially the more fun we'll have. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, our run's definitely going to be interesting. We're not going to know what's happening. I think until it's happening. Yeah. And then we're just going to have to roll with the punches at that point. Mm -hmm. But that's fine. Yeah. And I think that is one of our strong suits mm. over the years of traveling together is our ability to be somewhat prepared, but also not prepared at all. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because you never know, like some opportunity might present itself. And that's something else, too. Because um, like along the route of the rally, there are sort of these pit stops and these experiences that like, you know, many people recommend to do. So I think like in like Turkey, there's the, is it Turkey? They have like the hot air balloons. Oh yes. Yeah. It's in Turkey. Right. Yeah. So there's those. And then like, you know, you and I are both hikers. So like whenever we see like a, a, a you know, attractive looking mountain, I'm sure we're just going to pull over and do some hiking. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's also like, like in Turkmenistan, I absolutely have to go see that fire pit. Oh, absolutely. 800%. We're going there. And just like all these little things and like, you know, there's so many little things that, you know, we, we have heard about um, just from previous rallyers. And then there's lots of little things that I'm sure that we'll only get to know about from locals. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to, I don't want to miss it on those experiences. Cause if we like have a too tight of a schedule, then we're not going to be able to detour. Cause like, I mean, a lot of these places, we might never be able to go back there again. Right. After this. So yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Whatever opportunity comes our way, I want to seize it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. What do you think? Well, I think, I think that's about it on time today. Okay. But I hope that gave everyone listening sort of a good idea of what the Mongol rally is and why we're doing it. So while we are doing the rally, we're also going to be doing regular updates. Um, that's mm -hmm. going to be like in a year time. So please stick around with us until then. But we also have an interview coming up, right? Yeah, so our next podcast is going to be an interview with somebody that did the rally two years ago now, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll get to hear from somebody that's been on the road, has had these experience, and listen to his stories, tips, woes, <laughs> delights, everything. Yeah, stay tuned. If you're listening from a team that will be joining us on the 2021 rally then the next podcast will probably be particularly interesting for you as we ask him some very common questions including what car should you drive and i don't know i don't know what other questions we'll find out we'll find out exactly i'm <laughs> i'm so curious i can't wait yeah so thank you for tuning in again today and we'll catch you next time all right bye hi this is caitlin from get over it 
Uh, recently, Sam and I were interviewed by Tom Page at The Worst Traveler, and it was awesome. Like, we had such a fun time talking to him, uh, and I've listened to his podcast since then, and it is incredible. If you want to hear a lot of really interesting travel stories, um, including getting death threats in India, then please check him out. So he has his own website. It's www.theworsttraveler.com. You can also find him on Instagram at The Worst Traveler and also at Tom Page. Uh, and then you can also check out his podcast on Apple Podcasts and on Listen Notes. So highly recommend it. We had such a great time with him and please show him some love and support. That's it for today, folks. Thanks so much for tuning in. And as always, please support this work by subscribing and donating to our cause at www.teamgetoveryit.com. Donors get access to specific content like stickers, t-shirts, and postcards from our journey. You can donate for as little as $5 and the benefits build from there. Go to our website for more info. Or find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Team Get Over It. Thanks for listening. And catch us next time on Get Over It.